Well, uh, Ed's reports that uh, Claude Russell is not well and he cannot come today. And he was kind enough to offer an alternative program. So we're going to have Vince and today, and as everyone knows him from the newspaper or before, he is, has a man, it's a man with a sense of humor and lots of information. And Vince is going to be talking about uh, telling your story so that you can pass along your personal story, your history, to other generations. And he will explain that uh, in more detail. But I have a present for Vince before we get started. <coughs> Vince is uh, very addicted to sugar daddies. <laughs> and I do believe that I have found the largest sugar daddy that exists. <laughs> a couple of wheels. And we are going to, Chris, we're presenting this to Vince. And we hope his team wow. survive. This is a lifetime supply. Nice. <laughs> I thought it was just for a week. Yeah, you're, you're too sitting this down. Uh, well, I went to PNS, uh, Vince, and I said, Where are your sugar daddies? And they said, oh, we haven't had them for a long time now. I said, you better get some. <laughs> so you know where to go? Uh, he knows where to go. This one, no, that's Cracker Barrel. Oh, Cracker, I see him in the Cracker Barrel all the time. Ah, yeah. uh, okay. <laughs> well, we're delighted to have you here. Thank you. Claude Russell sends glad tidings. He wishes he could be here. But retirement has just not set well with uh, Claude. He retired two years ago. Uh, and he did not want to retire. I think about 2009, Claude had baseball pitcher surgery, had rotator cuff surgery, and it was just never the same after that. A uh, fellow named Eddie Durham, I'm sure a lot of you remember Eddie, he told me once, he said, Eddie worked for press for years and years and years. He said his goal the whole time he was working at the Kingsport Press was one day he wanted to be the first person in Claude's shop one morning. Claude's advertised hours were 5 a.m. to 5 p.m., but Claude was always there at 4.30, and there was always somebody waiting on Claude at 4.30. And Eddie said he had tried and tried and tried, and he, he wasn't able to do that until after Claude's surgery Claude was out a good while, and some of his customers just uh, didn't come back. So his business, he told me, was down about a half after that. And then as his arm kept getting worse and worse and worse, he, uh, he finally had to hang up the clippers and go home, and Claude had no hobbies. I called him many a time, and the first thing out of his mouth is, I'm bored. <laughs> So he's watching a lot of TV. Right before Christmas, I went over to see him because um, he had lost about 40 pounds this year and they couldn't figure out what. And I said, Claude, what can I do for you? And he said, tell people to send me a Christmas card. So I have been sick and I haven't been able to get back over there to look at the Christmas cards he got. He, he wants me to go through some of the stories in there. But he got 293 Christmas cards from all over the country and all over the world. And that's not a tribute to me or my column. That's a tribute to the fact that all these people wanted to, uh, to send Claude a Christmas card and, and tell him how much they loved him. Now today is March 2nd, and you may not know, but it's the 98th birthday of Kingsport. And it's sort of almost the uh, 99th birthday of the Kingsport Times News. We were born a year before, and I can't say definitively what day we were born because the first two issues are lost. Nobody has any idea of whatever happened. And I suspect if we go into Old Kingsport or Sullivan Gardens and tear down a bunch of houses and get in those walls, we will find those first two issues. We have the third issue, and it looks like 
it was taken out of a wall in Sullivan Gardens. <laughs> King Four Times was founded by a guy named uh, Sal Lyle, who's a military man out of Johnson City. He had a newspaper over there called the Johnson City Common, which was a weekly. There's another newspaper over there called the Johnson City Staff, which is a daily. So he was sort of swimming uphill over there. But as he saw this little town over here, start bringing in businesses. He decided he was going to open a second newspaper here. Now this goes against almost everything, uh, every newspaper's birth back in those days. Almost every newspaper was open for political reasons. Some Democrat would open a newspaper like the Memphis Commercial Appeal. Well, I forget which is which, but the commercial, if it came first, it was a Republican paper and some Democrat opened another paper. So that was what it was. Not here, not in Kingsport. Cy Little opened this as a money-making venture, which sort of fits in with really the, the birth of the whole town. I mean, uh, Eastman didn't come down here to just to give good jobs to the Hill people. They came down here to make money. Me, press, all those people. So he started his first year his editor was a guy named uh, R.B. Kincaid. They got out the, I'm sorry, they got out those, I have a little obsessive compulsive about it, always <laughs> rearranging. <laughs> his first editor was a guy named R.B. Kincaid. Uh, we don't know anything, he got the first two issues out and had an attack of appendicitis and they put him in the hospital in Bristol because this is in the third issue is how we know that. And they brought in his brother, B.K. Kincaid, who became the second editor of the Kingsport Times after two weeks. B.K. put it out until R.B. recovered and got back here. So Cy Little and, and R.B. Kincaid put it out until 1920 when, uh, well, I mean, I'm sorry, 1918, when they brought in a guy named Isaac Schumer. And he became the new editor. He was editor for one year, and he left. And he's the only uh, employee in the history of the Kingsport Times that went from the Kingsport Times to the New York Times. Hmm. And in fact, they sent him, New York Times sent him back, uh, what, six years later, and he covered the Scopes Monkey Trial hmm. for the New York Times. Isaac Schumer gave way to a guy named Howard Long, who took over in 1920 and was the editor for 12 years shaking your heads. I think he's the only newspaper editor in the history of America who gave up such a good job to be the postmaster of Kingsport. <laughs> and that's what he was for many years. Uh, during the war, the Times News was edited by Ellis Binkley, Bink as we all called him, who was 4F because Bink had uh, bad vision. It was Ellis Binkley in the all-girl newsroom <laughs> during the war. Uh, after the war, Bob Barnett, W.J. McAuliffe, who'd been here all along, he had been editor, he had been business manager. You may remember he wrote a column, Max Window, that ran up until, I guess, about the time he died, about 1960. Uh, in 1940, 39 or 40, C.P. Edwards Jr. bought the newspaper, and he kept it for 21 years. And in 62, he sold it to Sandusky Publishing, and they've had it ever since. If you're wondering, the longest continuous employed writer at the Times News was Bill Lane, a sports writer, who started in 62 and wrote for 50 years. And I don't know how many of you know Bill, or if you've ever been around when Bill has spoken. Bill has covered high school athletics around here for so long, he knows where all the bodies are buried. <laughs> <laughs> and he has some great stories. My favorite was from early in his tenure. Probably the most famous athlete ever to come out of Tri-Cities, or maybe a tie between Bobby Dodd and Steve Spurrier over in Johnson City. Well, right before Steve Spurrier's senior year, which was the fall of 1962, uh, 
Tom Brixey, new football coach at Dobbins Bennett, hired a new assistant coach, a guy named Chuck Lane. Now, Chuck Lane was what we today would call the offensive coordinator at Science Hill, but they just called him assistant coaches back then. So he came over that summer right before the senior year. Bill Lane tells me that Chuck Lane told him he knew where the Spurriers lived, so he sneaked over one night. He knew where Steve's bedroom was, and he threw pebbles up at Steve's window late at night. Of course, you know Steve's father was a minister of the Presbyterian Church over there. And he, he says, Steve, this is God. Transfer to Dobbins Bennett. <laughs> <laughs> it didn't work. <laughs> Over the years, the Times News has employed a lot of interesting um, writers. Our nation's poet laureate, Charles Wright, was a police reporter for the Times News one summer. And I have read his stories, and it's very obvious that he. He started out with a writer's flair, and he really produced these wonderful little stories about drunks <laughs> who were arrested. And then you can see, as he goes along that summer, an editor has gotten a hold of him by the neck and strangled all the creativity out of his uh, police reports. We had a guy named Bob Smith who uh, worked there, and he eventually left for the National Enquirer, not because he wrote uh, fiction here, although I'm not sure, <laughs> but he was a really good storyteller. He found a lot of great stories. Anytime I'm going through the old archives and I see a Bob Smith story, no matter what I'm looking up, I stop and read it. Another person I do that on was Joan Rosgen, whose husband was editor Bill Roche, and he's the one who brought the newspaper into the 20th century. Before him, we did what was called eight, eight column layout. You know, you have eight columns, you have 20 or 30 stories, you have headlines here, there, and everywhere. And he gave it a modern design and um, made a lot of changes, made a lot of enemies. Joni made a lot of enemies too. She's the one who integrated uh, Macra, the, the men's club at Macrae Cafeteria. You may remember Macrae's had a section It was just sort of by, uh, by agreement that it was all men and she integrated it and wrote about that. So anyway, we're, uh, we're getting ready to celebrate our 100th birthday in 1916, which would be <laughs> right around this time. And uh, I think we're going to put out a book that I hope will not be boring and academic. Uh, I think there's so many interesting stories that we've covered <coughs> over the years that we can pull out and put into this book. I don't know if any of you have been down on Broad Street lately. I went down there, well, Friday, because I've just written about. Uh, the Escalator that came to town with J. Fred Johnson's 1956. And uh, all the country people came to town and didn't know how to get on an escalator. And, you know, if you've never seen an escalator before, this would be pretty intimidating. You've got stairs, accordion and up. You've got a rail here. Which do I do? Do I do the rail? Do I do the step? Do I do? I can't do both. So you had good country people bringing their whole families, and I can just imagine. A friend of mine told me the story of his grandmother and the whole family. And I, in my in my mind, I can picture Grandma. She's got on her good dress. She's got her hose on. She's got her hat on, and her gloves, and her shawl. And she's leading the whole family as they approach the escalator, and she makes that first fatal step. <laughs> And suddenly, you could just see the whole family, even the little kids looking up, even though they know their, their lemmings going off the cliff. <laughs> They've got to follow Grandma. <laughs> and he said it was like bowling pitch. <laughs> <laughs> so I, when I wrote that, it got, got me to thinking about J. Fred Johnson's before 
1956, and I'm sure many of you remember. It was up there where uh, Nooks and Crannies has been lately. And I drove past there. I just wanted to take a look at it, and they had taken the facade off. Have any of you been by there? You need to go up there because if, if you do, you'll see that there's some letters up there. Now, this, this stuff always fascinates see these old letters. What was that building? And there's a lot of like mud that was holding the old facade up. So it's a little tough to figure it out. So I had to park and get out and read it. Cincinnati Bargain Store was one half of it. I'm sure you all shopped at the Cincinnati Bargain <laughs> Store. Does anybody ever remember hearing of the Cincinnati Bargain Store? I looked it up. I could, I could never find any sort of biography of the store, but I found there were Cincinnati bargain stores in 1900 in Kentucky, in Xenia, Ohio. I, I found them everywhere but Cincinnati, which is interesting. <laughs> and in 19, this one went out of business in 1932 because J. Fred Johnson bought it. And there was another store right next to it that I couldn't quite read the lettering. So I dug around and I did find what it is and I'm not going to tell you what it was because I'm going to save that for a column. But there are two stores side by side and J. Fred bought them both and he moved his store. J. Fred Johnson's store in 56 when they opened a new store that had the escalator. The Times ran a little history of uh, J. Fred Johnson. Started in 1906 at Rotherwood as sort of a feeding seed. You ever know that? Then, I mean, 1906, how many people could there have been here? 400, 300? But the business was good at the feeding seed, and according to this story, they opened a second feeding seed, and it said approximately where Compton Terrace is. Now, I I don't think of, I think of that as Hammond Park up there, that flat area. So I don't know if it was down. At that time, in 1906, Sullivan Street would have been the Knoxville Highway. I don't know what shape it would have been in, but that would have been a, a logical place to put a feed and seed. So they put the second one there in 1907. And then in 1908, they built a building at the corner of Main Street and Shelby. And moved in there and they called it the Kingsport Store. But people started calling it the big store because he kept enlarging it. And pretty soon it became one of those cradle to the grave stores when he brought in Jimmy Hamlet to, to uh, oversee the undertaking department. I don't know, I wasn't alive then. They bring them in the back door or what? <laughs> but the big store survived from uh, then until 1932 when J. Fred Johnson bought the, the slot up on Broad Street. Moved in there. Many of you went in there because that was J. Fred. He changed the name from the big store to uh, J. Fred Johnson's. And it was there until 1956 when he opened that new modern palace. That was a gorgeous store, I, I thought, even as a kid, with that uh, black and white brick, those high ceilings. Oh, I mean, you just wanted to go there. So one of the things I was going to tell you about today was going there in 1956. When my mother and I went, I lived at the Upper Circle, which has no meaning in and hasn't had any meaning for many, many years. But the upper circle is essentially the end of Center Street. And in 1956, my father was working downtown at Penny's. And um, my mother couldn't drive, so the only way we got to town, and we did it all the time, is we took the bus. I want to tell you about a bus trip to downtown in we walked across Bristol Highway to the bus stop. Garden which oh, I'm sorry. Uh, <laughs> let me just, Garden Basket? Yeah. yeah. What? 
for Mozambique number two. <laughs> That's my church. Uh, Bethel Presbyterian Church, Poston's Grocery. It's now Poston's Grocery is now a Shell Station, mm -hmm. and the Garden Basket and Model City Motel uh, seems to be a place where people make meth. Uh, and the Guard Basket, the Guard Basket was. We'll talk about that in just a second. But do you understand where it is now? Uh, Center Street runs into Memorial Boulevard. Dead end. War path. There was no war path for many years. So we'd go just right across the street and wait for the bus. Sit downtown on it. Kingsport City buses. They were green. And the bus driver would stop. My mother would lift me up. She would get up and then she would take and drop the dime in the slot. And that was like music when you heard that dime going down through there. Or maybe sometimes she didn't have a dime, she had a quarter. So she'd hand the bus driver a quarter and he would go, <laughs> and a little change thing. And he would give her two dimes and a nickel and she'd put it. We'd get on the bus, the bus would head out. When we were coming home, we came on the Highland Hillcrest bus. That's what it would say up there. And one of those old buses is in a junkyard, Bloomingdale Pike. If you run to the end of Bloomingdale Pike, there's a junkyard on the right, and one of those old city buses there. It's the only place I've seen one. So we just get on, we're sitting in our seats, and I'll look over, and there's this fallen mansion look. Just, just east of uh, Model City Motel and Garden Basket. What it started out as was Harvey uh, Brooks Commissary for Brooks Sand and Gravel. Had offices upstairs and the commissary downstairs because they had a uh, quarry right up on the hill. If you drive up there today, if you turn up Central, Go two blocks, turn on Shamrock. You'll see what used to be the quarry. They've completely filled it in. When I was a kid, it was not filled in. It was still a quarry. And that was only two blocks from my house. And all of us were forbidden from going anywhere near the quarry. So usually, as soon as we all got together, we'd ride our bicycles <laughs> out, <laughs> park on the edge of the quarry, and dare each other. But that was... Uh, Quarry. Well, in uh, 47, Harvey Brooks sort of mined out that quarry and uh, left it just the way it was, but he sold the house to a guy named Leonard Brickey. Now, Leonard Brickey grew up in southwest Virginia. He was a movie man. He had a tent and a projector, and he would travel around southwest Virginia, southeastern Kentucky, upper east Tennessee. He'd set up a tent in a community for a week, and he would show movies. And he could move on. In fact, he even made a movie. Uh, he made a, a nativity story, uh, which I would love to see. His daughter and I went through his shed many years ago, looking at all the old boxes of films open up these canisters, and you're immediately hit with the note they had all disintegrated. None of his, none of his movies, so even that one is uh, lost. But in uh, 1929, 1930, this thing came out called Sound, and that pretty much put the traveling uh, motion picture exhibitionists out of business. Because nobody, you couldn't hear in these tents, there'd be trains going by. So he moved into Kingsport and he bought a building in uh, Highland, Highland Park, and opened Bricky Store. It's called a Variety Store, and had that for many years, and moved into uh, the house that had been Harvey Brooks. Well, in 1953, the Upper Circle development, commercial development, hit the Upper Circle, and that's when they built the Garden Basket. Model City Motel. Postons was already there. We'll get to Postons in a minute. Uh, 
And then they built a little shopping center that had swords, barber shop, uh, deals floor covering. And then there was this one storefront that was just sort of a rotating. Nothing ever made it there. Well, Leonard Brickey, who'd always been sort of an entrepreneur, saw that the uh, Model City Motel was doing so well, so he decided to build his own motel. Still sitting there, it's called Brickey's Motel. It's white and it's got arches, and it's right on the corner there of uh, what I still call Bristol Highway and Central Street, and opened up in 55, and it's Essentially, I wouldn't even mention it because it's not worth mentioning, except it did uh, have its one moment. In September of 1955, he was sitting out in his lawn chair, as he did every day, right next to the office, and a pink Cadillac convertible pulled up with uh, four young boys in it, and they wanted to rent a room. They had done a show in Roanoke the night before, they were looking for some place to take a shower. They were going to do a, a show at the Civic Auditorium that night. Uh, the driver was a guy named DJ Fontana, who was the drummer. Uh, in the back seat was Bill Black, later famous for Bill Black's combo. The other side was Scotty Moore, and sitting in the shotgun yeah. was a young singer named Elvis Presley. Oh. <coughs> 20 years old, but in 1955, nobody heard of him, especially Leonard Brickey had never heard of Elvis Presley. <laughs> His daughter tells me that he was reluctant to rent to him, but they did have a nice car, and they were very polite, so he rented a room to him, and um, he didn't think, he didn't save the uh, sign-in sheet. He never even remembered which room he, he rented to him, which could be a disadvantage, or or you could always just for years later rent all the rooms as the one. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Elvis played the Civic Auditorium. That was his last night on the road after a long, long trip. And it was also the last time he was not the headline act. The headline act was uh, Hawkshaw Hawkins, who was later killed in a plane crash with Patsy Klein. And uh, the Leuven Brothers, Bluegrass Group, and Elvis was the middle act on that show. Um, so we got the bus, we're going down through there, there's the garden basket. The garden basket was a wonderful place when I was a kid. That's where we got our soft drinks, and that's where we got our baseball. Tops had figured out this really inventive way to do baseball cards. They released them in series. So they put out a hundred, and then a month later, a different hundred. So if you're trying to collect the whole set, you've got to go every week and buy at least a nickel pack to see is this a new series, is this the old series. So you're always playing every little market in town. Daddy, would you, would you take me to Russell News? See if they've got the new baseball. Would you take me to Oakwood Variety? We had two right there, so we could go on one side of the street to the garden basket and the other side to Poston's Market. Poston's Market was also famous for its hot dogs. I don't know if you ever had a hot dog there. Yes. Mrs. Poston. I asked Jim Poston what Mrs. Poston's secret was. The dog or what? He said that she would. Uh, Boil the hot dogs, put them in the bun, and put them in a box. I did 12 in a box. And then she would hot towel and put it over the box. And that would steam the buns, he said. And that was her secret. She had wonderful hot dogs. Um, the other thing we used to get at Poston's were the soft drinks. Now, in the summer, my buddies and I. It's a, it's a dough. That's not a soft drink. Well, I was. We have a lot of people here from the north. Oh, okay. East brought them all in. <laughs> <laughs> a soda dope, or a dope, you're right. Anyway, we'd get our dopes there, except we, would, we wouldn't get dopes in the summer when we were out riding our bicycles, we were 
hot and sweaty. In the summer, we'd always get either, my favorite was an orange crush, the real orange crush before Coca-Cola bought it and turned it into an orange something. But it was in a brown bottle, and they always told us it was in that brown bottle to protect the flavor. That kept the sun out. That didn't explain how a knee-high orange could be in a clear bottle and still taste pretty good, too. <laughs> but Orange Crush was our favorite. Then we had a drink called Cheerwine, which uh, sold very well. Yeah, we, uh, we didn't know at the time until, you know, you, you spread out, go on vacation somewhere, and you can't get a Cheerwine because it was only sold in 100 miles at that time and a 100-mile radius of Salisbury, North Carolina. Apparently, we were right on the outskirts of that. And the third favorite drink was a great bed, which was shaped yeah. like sort of a robot woman. <laughs> Six ounces. Oh, they were wonderful. Yes. And somebody makes a great bed now, and it's a purple drink. How about a true way? True Aid, we did True Aid, we did Knee High, we did them all, but I'm just telling you our three favorites. But that wasn't in the winter. In the winter, well, fall and winter and spring, we switched to Coca Cola. And not Coca Cola. <coughs> Coca Cola. For one reason, we preferred Coke to Pepsi for one reason because when you finish drinking it, you hold up the bottom of the bottle and see where it came from. Right. And about 80% uh, about of them were from Johnson City. <laughs> we all thought, wow, wow. Bismarck, we're drinking a Coke from Bismarck, North Dakota. Well, you're really drinking a Coke from Johnson City. It's in a bottle that came originally as people moved around the country. Because the way we paid for our, uh, our dopes back then was we would ride along the highway Thank you, all you trashy people who threw your bottles out the window. That's what enabled us to buy our soft drinks. Um, two cents. We got two cents for a soft drink, and a soft drink cost a nickel. Now, I know there are mean boys around this town who did stuff like go around back of a market where they stored the empty soft drink bottles. <coughs> Get them two or three and bring them around front. Trade them in again. <laughs> but we didn't do that. We were we were good boys. <laughs> so I'm riding on the bus and I look over just past the garden basket. There's a house, but nobody lives in it anymore. In fact, I don't know when anybody lived in it. My next door neighbor that I always call Mammy, she said when they first moved out there, she says a beer joint called the High Hat Club, and uh, it really was a beer joint. I found numerous times when it was closed down by the police for selling <coughs> stuff they didn't have a license to sell. But in 1956, when we were uh, riding the bus, it was called Jimmy's Steakhouse. Jimmy's Diner. Jimmy's Diner. And in 1956, 55, Elvis, remember Elvis? Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. Remember he played at the Civic Auditorium? Well, after he, after he played, he went out in the parking lot and flirted with a lot of girls and managed to get three of them to go out to dinner with him. Billy Mae Smith, Darla Hodge, I cannot remember the name of that other girl. But anyway, they went with him and his... Uh, his guys and they went to Jimmy's Steakhouse and they had a cheese sandwich. <laughs> <laughs> and then they sort of separated. They uh, had two cars. So Elvis and Billy May went down and in 1956, what did a young man with a pink Cadillac and a girl by his side, where did they go in Kingsport? Cruise Broad. Cruise Broad. You know it immediately. Cruise Broad. But as they were <coughs> heading down to Cruise Broad at uh, the light at Wilcox, they were stopped, and a car pulled up next to them, and it's one of those. 
the guy driving it looks over. That's my girlfriend. <laughs> it was a guy named Wayne Booge Allen. And he was not happy to see that his girlfriend was driving around with uh, Elvis. Well, he went to get his buddies because he knew where they were going. They were going down to Broad. And by the time he got down to Broad, they'd already finished. And Elvis had brought her back to her house. She lived on Catawba below the high school. It's a white house. If you're heading into town, it's on the left. And they sat out on the porch and uh, drank coffee and talked. And she said Elvis was a gentleman. And Boo Jones showed up with his buddies. And they wanted to fight. It was 1956. You know, a rebel without a cause had just come out the year before. And Elvis finally gets up and he says, I'm breaking the sky's heart. Let's get out of here. He leaves, and she and Booge Allen get back together. But they didn't marry. But they still call each other every year on their birthdays. <laughs> All right, we're driving. We're driving down. We're getting ready to turn. <laughs> right before we turn, there's a filling station. It's a Jeter Shell station. Across the street is Kennedy's Esso station. So now we're heading down Center Street towards Highland Park. Over on the left, there's a, a farm, the Dixon Farm. Yeah. Bill Dixon, any of you yeah. knew Bill Dixon, who was the catcher on, what, was that the 51 DB baseball team that won the state? Yeah. Or 53? 52. He was a catcher on that team. His uh, sister, Gloria Dixon, and his other sister, Agnes, but by 56, Agnes Dixon was married to J.D. Weiniger. Now, J.D. Weiniger was Santa Claus at the Eastman Christmas party every year for about 20 years. And 1956 was about the peak. This is when the baby boomers are all starting to hit their uh, give me something for Christmas Santa Claus period. At that time, 4,000 kids so let's keep on heading out Center Street. Uh, next we see a shop called the Remnant Shop. I don't know if any of you uh, went into the Remnant Shop. If you sewed or if your mother sewed, my mother sewed. I, I can never forget going into the Remnant Shop. Going the door. Wow! The smell of that dye would knock you down. Next door to the Remnant Shop was a grocery store called a Joiner Grocery. This is in an era of Kingsport when little neighborhood grocery stores. Uh, Georgie Stone, Golden Rule, every neighborhood seemed to have one and they delivered. I can still hear my mother. May, that was Mrs. Joiner. May, this is Mrs. Staten. I'd like three nice bananas. And she'd go through her whole grocery list. They would pack them up in a box, and Lewis would drive in our driveway. He'd open the back door. He'd just come right in and put them down. I know George Stone um, and Golden Rule, some houses, they would go in, and they wouldn't just put them on the table. They'd put the milk in the refrigerator <laughs> and the eggs in the refrigerator. It's a different era then. Uh, across the street from Joiner Grocery, on a little bit of a hill, was... Uh, the old roller place. The rollers at one time owned everything from right there all the way to Brooks' Circle. Do you know where Brooks' Circle is, Jim? Brooks' Circle is Eastman Road, Fort Henry, and it used to be Bristol Highway Memorial Drive. And it really was a circle. And they sold out uh, eventually to the mall. Took over the entire, pretty much the entire roller. In 1956, the Roller Woods was uh, the little putter miniature dog. Yes. And then down there on the, the V, you had the Zesto. So as cold as it's been, I still right now feel nostalgia for the Zesto and the Martinique restaurant. But the bus didn't go that way. 
bus went down Center Street. So we're still going down Center Street. There's next to next to Joyner Grocery, there's a garage. There was a garage in 1956. It's now Fleming's. Um, next to it was a basement church. It was a basement church for years and years and years. It's now Bellevue Christian, because that neighborhood is called Bellevue. I always call it Greater Highland, but Bill Green at the Jan Mart keeps telling me, no, it's Bellevue. So we keep on going down. Right before we get to Bricky's Variety Store, on the left, there are a bunch of houses that have porches. And I swear, when I was a kid, and on up into my 20s, driving along there, there was a guy that was sitting out on the porch every day that had an eye patch. Do any of you remember that guy? Very famous in Highland. Well, we'll continue on past him. Then. Get on down. Highland was like a little city of its own back then. They had a drugstore. They had a movie theater. They had uh, Leaper's Market. They had Willis's Butcher Shop. Um, today, we get there, and there's a red light at Eastman Road. That didn't even exist in 1956. There was a little road there. It was called B Street. And it would be... <coughs> several years before B Street became anything. Uh, in fact, I was going through some old clips and I found a 1949 Times News top of the front page headline. Construction begins today on Super Highway. The Super Highway finally opened 15 years later. And how many governors did we elect to get that <laughs> highway? When they did finish it, then they had to cut B Street through. And the first uh, commercial venture I remember there, there was a filling station. And on the left was, the, what was it, Biff Burger? <coughs> and Biff Dogs, where they cut the dog apart. Anyway, we're heading on down. Over on the left, after we get past B Street, is the <coughs> Legion Post. Cannon. Remember the cannon? Gone now. They tore the or took the cannon out. It was in apparently really bad shape. Uh, I think about five years ago. And they gave it to the American Legion in Gate City. And they have repaired it, fixed it up, and put it on Memorial Highway, Gate City uh, going northeast. I haven't been over to see it. I need So right then, that's where Watauga Street goes up the hill at what is still the worst intersection in Kingsport. Anybody who would come down that, my father drove a 1961 Oldsmobile for about eight years with the door caved in from where he came down that hill. Somebody right into it. Um, but also in that little sliver, there's a little commercial building, Kabul's Grocery. Yet another. Kabul's was famous for many things, but most people remember it for their chili. And I have almost got the recipe out of one of the Kabul girls. She gave me a close approximation. I don't know what she thinks. She's got a million dollar recipe that it, it ain't happening. Um, Go on down past Kabul's. We look to the left, and there's the fire station. And on a, on a warm spring day, you can see them out there playing croquet. That was a harbinger of spring. As soon as you saw the firemen out there playing croquet, we go on down. We got another sliver where Fort Henry Drive comes in. It was called Memorial Boulevard in '56, and there's a service station right there. And then there was a very popular item from the 50s. There was a, a red light that was right in the middle of the street. We had another one, another famous one, downtown Market and Broad Street, where they had the red light right there. And they had the uh, all the protective uh, that they put around it. Of course, it beat up <laughs> everybody. <laughs> then next. 
next right there is Peggy Ann. I don't need to say more about the Peggy Ann. Next to Peggy Ann was Armor Drugs, which had a uh, soda fountain that was very popular with uh, high school kids. Next to that was the first Kroger's, which is now Max uh, Medicine Mart. Go on just a little further on the bus and look over, and there's Mayfair Methodist Church. M A F A I R. Did they misspell that? No. No, it's no. Yes, it was. Maple Street Methodist Church and Fairview that were combined to make Mayfair. My Uncle Earl Milburn was the first pastor of that uh, combined church. He was a, a giant of a man. He must have been 6'8". He, uh, he wore shoes that looked like Bozo would wear them. I mean, the big giant shoes. And the story of the family is when I was born, he came down to Holston Valley Community Hospital to visit my mother and me. And they didn't have an elevator yet. So he had to walk up. I don't know how many floors there were then. Four, six. Anyway, he had to walk up four or six flights of stairs and he got up just in time to collapse of a heart attack. So my mother told me that my whole life, and I've always thought, I caused my Uncle Earl's heart attack. Well, I went to Mayfair Methodist Church a few years ago to do a story. And they have old pastors. And they have the years that they were pastored. And there's my Uncle Earl's picture. And he was pastored in 1951. I was born in 1947. It was my sister who caused his heart attack. Not me. I've been living a lie. <laughs> well, we continue on uh, on down Broad Street. Pretty soon we hit uh, Junior High, Kingsport Junior High. Except in 1956, it, had, it was newly renamed. It was called John Sevier Junior High because out east of town they built another junior high that they named Ross N. Robinson Junior High. I went to Ross and Robinson Junior High School. As you know, it's the school with the longest name in the country. Ross and Robinson Junior High School. We had to have 26 cheerleaders just to <laughs> spell out. <laughs> Ross and Robinson Junior High School. Bring an arm. Oh. And by the time they got Ross and Robinson Junior High School spelled out, Spear had scored. <laughs> Just past Severe, it's the building still there. It's got these odd round windows. And it was our first Chinese restaurant in the Far East, which I'm, I'm told was wonderful. We didn't eat out much when I was a kid. My mother made it. Chicken chow mein, she called it. Here's a can, here's a can. <laughs> eat this can, these are the nests. Put that in that. That was our, that was our uh, <coughs> Chinese. Um, keep on going down just a little further. On the left, there's uh, where uh, I keep wanting to call it Krispy Kreme, but it's not Krispy Kreme anymore. It's Seavers now. But before that, right about there, was a place called Brashear Motors. I don't know if any of you knew Russ Brashear. I'm real good friends with his son. And his son and I went over to uh, Piney Flats to visit one of his old employees, Glenn Hart, who just died recently. And Glenn had a piece of stationery to give to Rusty, his son. Rusty told me that during the war, he said, my dad knew the war was going to end eventually, and people were going to get back to normal life. So during the war, his dad bought every franchise he could possibly. This piece of stationery that Glenn Har had had 26 different businesses all over it. He, had, he was into electronics, he had radios. Um, one of the most interesting thing he, things he had was planes. He had the franchise for a private plane, it was a two passenger. And that strip of East Center Street, we think, is the only place in Kingsport where airplanes have landed on a street. That's when they bring the planes in. They 
close down his, his center and land them right there, right about where Severe goes down. He had Studebaker dealership too. Studebaker at Pontiac. Nash. Nash. He was he was quite a, an entrepreneur, but he had heart problems and he, he died very young. He died, I think, fifty six. Red Barnes. Uh, it's called Air Coop. That's right, Air Coop. Uh, Red Barnes was his right hand man, and when he started getting really sick, he sold the uh, Pontiac dealership to Red Barnes. Uh, Glenn Hart was his pilot. So I know about Glenn and all that stuff. Keep on going down Mackinac's Market, Mackinac's Apartments above it. Now we're turning, we've got Sullivan. Center Street. The bus stays on Center Street. And there's a little sliver there. In 1956, that was a service station called Spur. And I remember it very well as a kid because it, it was like a carnival. They had racks and racks of glasses and dishware and all you had to do was fill up and you got a glass or a dish, whatever you wanted, depending on how much you paid. You know, you could, you could fill your whole kitchen cabinet by buying glass at Spur. Keep on going down uh, Center Street, 56, right as you get past there. There are houses with hedges on and fences on each side. People were actually living there. We're almost, we're almost to downtown. As soon as you get past those houses, then you know, your heart starts beating faster. We're almost downtown. That's where you want to Downtown was the heart of the city. It was the heartbeat of the city. And the bus would stop right in front of Penny's there on the Center Street side. We'd get out, go right in. To the left was Men's Furnishings. At one time my father was manager of that. To the right was uh, Men's Work Clothes. Go straight ahead to the right and there was the candy counter, which was, of course, my favorite place to go. And they had right back next to the elevators. They still had elevator operators in 1956 because they didn't have an escalator and pennies. Um, so you would have, I mean, pennies only had a basement, first floor, mezzanine, and second floor. But because those elevators were the kinds where you had to crank the door open, crank it back shut, they had to have somebody to operate. That up. So we'd go in there and I'd go immediately to the candy counter where the women all knew me because my father worked there. And I would travel around, always going this way, always going counterclockwise until I figured out which candy I wanted. I'd go around two or three times and I always got the same thing. <laughs> and I was always tempted. Get those nuts because they smelled so good. Oh, because they were hot. They kept them hot. Uh, from there, we would go across the street to J. Fred's. And of course, in 1956, it just opened with the, the escalator. But J. Fred's was a palace. And that was where most everybody wanted to go was J. Fred's. And then we'd get on the bus and we'd go back home on the Highland Hillcrest bus. Thank you. Thank you.